Good morning. Good to be with you today as we continue in our study of Acts. Today we pick up in the 17th chapter and we find that uh, Paul and Silas have left uh, Philippi where they had ministered for several days to the Jews there and to the people in that area. But now they had moved on to uh, Thessalonica. And it says in the fourth chapter, uh, fourth verse of that 17th chapter, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a number of God-fearing Greeks. And I like the way Luke writes this, and not a few prominent women. So here is where we're going to have a source of influence. And perhaps in Thessalonica, like in Philippi, the women met by river uh, or by a lake uh, to share the gospel because uh, of the numbers there. But the message is being shared. And, and then uh, trouble came. Because in verse 5 it says, but the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. Well, because of this in, in Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki as it is today, or called that, uh, on the upper part, the northern part, of Greece, but they went to Berea, and interestingly in verse 11, it says, now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I imagine this was kind of a slap to the uh, Thessalonians that, well, you know, the Bereans here are a little bit a step above you. They're one more step up the ladder than you Thessalonians are. Uh, we study the, the Scripture every day. But when they had heard this, when the Jews in Thessalonia had heard this, uh, that Paul was preaching the word in Berea, they followed him there and were causing trouble again. So it says in the verse in verse 14, the brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought them to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join them as soon as possible. So here we get the scene of where Paul is now. He is in Athens by himself. Uh, Silas and Timothy are in Berea. They are waiting to get uh, to Paul, Paul is waiting for them. The, they are persecuted wherever they go uh, by Jews. And it says in verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And I read in one of the commentaries that there were as many or could be as many as 30,000 idols in the city of Athens. 30,000. They had an idol for everything. And the people were very uh, rigid about their beliefs and their idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. So here we have Greeks that have converted to Judaism. Uh, they 
uh, believe in Jesus. They are God-fearing, but they do not uh, follow all of the Jewish rituals. Uh, they are Greek, but they believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So he witnessed to the God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. So we see now kind of a spiritual warfare uh, beginning. Uh, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, who is this babbler uh, trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Babbler uh, is, is the term that they applied to someone who kind of picked up points from different uh, sources. This would be equivalent to someone being uh, part Baptist, part Catholic, part Jewish, part uh, something else, uh, widely read, but only an inch deep. And so they said, what is this babbler trying to say? You know, it, it sounds like uh, a foreign language. Uh, he is advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And here was a point of contention because neither the Epicureans or uh, the Stoics in, believed in resurrection. Uh, the, the Epicureans and the afterlife uh, uh, the Stoics, not so. Uh, we also have another group, uh, Pantheons, who believe that God is in everything. So there was this spiritual warfare going on, and Paul is there by himself waiting for Timothy and Silas to come, and he is debating with these people. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they brought him <clears throat> to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are preaching. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. And, and this is typical of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. In fact, it says parenthetically in verse 21, all the Athenians and the farmers who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Uh, so they didn't do much in a creative way. They simply uh, sat, did nothing, and talked about new ideas and new thoughts. So this was really a perfect place for Paul to preach because this was something that they would be curious about. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that every way you are very religious. Now, this could be used, that term religious, it could be used both as a point of criticism or it could be used as a point of praise. And of course, Paul wanted to use it as a point of praise because he wanted to get an audience. He wanted them to listen to him and to what he was preaching about Jesus being the Messiah. And so he said to them, men of Athens, I see that in every way that you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, and note the term, objects of worship, 
I looked carefully at them. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So they wanted to cover all the bases as if this 30,000 gods uh, that they already had, idols they already had, uh, were not enough, but they had another one uh, to something unknown. And, and this God, you don't know anything about, but he says, I'm going to proclaim to you something unknown, I'm going to let you know. And then the verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. So this would, would key the senses of the pantheists because they believe God was in everything, in people and plants and animals. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. So Paul is, is telling them about this unknown God, the God that he is preaching about gives man everything. He provides the land. He provides the homes. He provides the animals. He gives all men, not only all of the things that are evident by creation, but he gives all men life and breath and everything else from one man. Adam, he made every nation that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. So this God, this unknown God that I'm proclaiming to you, has created everything that you see. He has created man. He has given them life. He has determined the times that they're going to live, and he's going to determine where they're going to live. And then it says in verse 27, by way of explanation, he said, God did this so that. In other words, this is the plan that he put in place when he created all things, this is the God that you don't know. This is the one that has given you life. God did this so that man would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. In fact, this God, as they will find out, lives in you. That he lives in us through the Holy Spirit. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. This is the hope that God had, that because of what he had done for man that man would reach out to him, that man would worship him, even though he is not far from each one of us. And they relied on, on Greek poets, and a couple are quoted here. The first is, for in him we live and move and have our being. For in him we have our lives, our being, in him and through him. Some of our own poets have said, 
we are his offspring. What a blessing that this unknown God, and they are open because, as it, it says in verse 19, they, they, that's all they do is listen and talk about these different ideas. And then in verse 29 is this connective word, therefore, because of what I've shared with you about this unknown God, because of what I have shared you about uh, Jesus being the Messiah, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not take a think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by God's design and skill. That's not it. These figures that you are looking at, these gods that you are looking at that are made by man in the image of cows or bulls or some other figure that are made of stone or wood or gold, they, they can't do anything for you. But it says in 30, and here is the critical part or part of it, in the past God overlooked such ignorance. In other words, because of your ignorance, because you didn't know about this unknown God, because you didn't know that Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of God and, and can give you salvation and eternal life because you didn't know that. God overlooked such ignorance. He overlooked it. But now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. And then in verse 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, Jesus, the Messiah. In the past, God has overlooked our ignorance, but God has set a day when man will be judged for his sins, and he will be judged by Jesus, whom God appointed he has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So by the fact that Jesus came to earth as man, was crucified, was buried, and on the third day was raised from the dead, this is the proof to men that God has given us the Messiah. And then in verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the, of the dead, some of them sneered. Of course they did, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Some of them sneered, but others said, well, we want to hear you again on this subject. Uh, in other words, so far so good. We want to hear more. At that, Paul left the council a few men became followers of Paul and believed among this was Dionysus, a member of the Aragopolis, also a woman named, named Demarius, and a number of others. So the gospel was being shared in Athens. Uh, despite the persecution, despite the disbelief of men, uh, the, the groups like the uh, the Epicureans and the Pantheans and and uh, so the Stoics. Despite that, Paul shared the gospel that Jesus is the Messiah, and there were among those people that believed and accepted Jesus as Lord. Sometimes it's tough, but. 
we are called to share the gospel and to make disciples of all the earth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Luke writing for us Acts. We thank you for the persistence of Paul and Silas and Timothy that that despite uh, being beaten and flogged and jailed and harassed by their own people, that they persisted and shared uh, the will of God and shared that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, Father, we pray today for uh, those that are in the hospital or perhaps are traveling, uh, for those that that uh, don't know you, we pray, Father, that that we would be the ones that would be, as Paul and his team did, to share the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. All of these things we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless you.